Good morning, Rosemont. In our case, good afternoon, Rosemont. Whether it's here in Japan or there in church, it's always good to serve the Lord. Amen. Uh, real quick, I wanted to shout out to everyone uh, last week who voted on deacons. Thank you for re-electing me as a deacon of your of our church. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I will do the best I can to serve you better this year than I, I have in the past. And that's, we're all striving to serve the Lord better. Amen. Also, um, wanted to say, uh, we are having a budget vote today. Uh, the budget is very important to our church and to um, our missions. Uh, the budget reflects the church missions, of course. Uh, supporting the community, church activities, benevolence, of course, missionary work, wherever it might be. The church is transparent where your money goes. And today you can make a difference and encourage all of you to pray about it before you vote and after so you can follow what God puts on your heart. And with that said, um, today's scripture reading, Dave, right here. Uh, today is Luke 16, 10 through 13. He who is faithful in very little things is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? And if you have not been faithful in, these, in the use of that which is another's, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Second, second reading today is from Matthew, right here, <laughs> uh, 6, 19 through 21. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heavens. Whether neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's go to Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, you have entrusted us with the sacred responsibility of managing the financial responsibilities of our church. I ask for your wisdom, discernment, and guidance as we make decisions that impact the well-being of your house and the fulfillment of your missions. Heavenly Father, grant us clarity of mind and heart attuned to your will as we navigate the complexities of budgeting, stewardship, and resources as we embark on a new year. Lord, help keep us safe as we continue with your missions and spreading your word. Give us the strength while we stay focused and in faith that your love may shine through us and through this church as we serve you. Amen. We love you very much, Patty and I. We miss you. Whether it's in church there or here at U Beach, Iwakuni in Japan, we always try to share our love with you the best we can. Patty, Patty loves you too. Yes. And as always, Jesus loves you. <laughs> A living sacrifice. You know, when you think about it, boy, that's, that comes out so nice and easy and sweet on our lips when we're here in church. But how does that work come Monday morning? How does that work on Monday morning? Every year about this time, we do consider our church budget. And uh, Ellen has accused me more than once of uh, preaching the business meeting and uh you know, as as you've heard me say at business meeting and when we're considering our budgets, though it doesn't necessarily appear this way, but it is one of the more spiritual things that we do when we determine the direction of our resources as a church. 
And, and, and we, the budget is made up on what we expect to receive in tithes and offerings. And, and, and as we looked at the charts and we've seen over the years, our, our gifts have gone up and down. Uh, but it has been my experience that regardless of what our budget is and regardless of what the level of the tithes and offerings, God has always provided the funds for the things that he has called for us to do. Always, always. And, 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 and when we look back a little bit of history here, uh, do you remember when COVID first hit, you know, back in uh, 2000 and, and we actually shut down for a couple of weeks and, or actually a couple of months and we started back slowly and everything else. You know, there was, there was a program with the government saying, uh, for small businesses, they would make, uh, uh I won't say loans, but it was no interest. It was, uh, almost grants, uh, to small all businesses, uh, uh, funds to come in so they can keep people on payroll, uh, so they can keep people gainfully employed. And, and, and these funds were also available to churches as well. Now, here at Rosemont, we never once consider using that resource, well, for several reasons. Uh, number one, I don't believe the church should ever be beholding be, be to the government for any reason. Number one, but, but number two, when we go back and we look at our tithes and offerings that came in during that time, our, our tithes and offerings were at an all time high. We were never lacking a cent to do anything, including salaries, which I'm very grateful for, and, 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 and everything else that we did. We always had the funds. And, and today, as we look at our budget for the coming year, and, and, and at the end of the service, we're going to hand out ballots and we're going to vote on that. And I fully expect us to, to pass the budget. We do every year, but it's an important formality because it means the church is behind what we had decided to do. But it's, it's on this day that we, uh, we've designated as Stewardship Sunday. And, and stewardship, if you haven't caught on, stewardship is the, um, is the church code word for giving and, and, uh, everybody needs to hang tight to their wallet. And, and we hear people say, oh, it's the church asking for money again. And, and I, I hate that. And I hate that, uh, impression that it gives because it makes the church and God in general look like a, a poor beggar standing with hat in hand, uh, looking for any crumb or a bone that somebody might toss our way. That is not the case. That is not the case. We look in Psalms, Psalms 50, verses 10 to 12, and there are many such Psalms. But it says, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird of the mountains and everything that moves in the field is mine. If I were hungry, this is God speaking. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine and all that it contains. And the fact is, God owns it all. We are just caretakers of all that he has blessed us with. And, and, and you see, as caretakers, that, that's just, that's, that's the description of a steward. And we talk about stewardship. How do we care for what God has given us? And, and we need to understand that God will see to it that he will underwrite any ministry that he calls us to do here. But first and foremost, when it comes to giving, and when it comes uh, not just simply the giving of ourselves, but as our finances, as we talk about, it, it, it's all about trusting Him. It's all about trusting God. Well, you know, we we will trust Jesus with our eternity, but we're not so fast to trust Him with our wallets. You know, the fact is, when it comes to tithing, uh, you know, and tithing is just simply giving 10% of our income, uh, I believe that God can take the 90% that we keep, can make it go further than if we kept the whole 100%. Now, don't ask me how that works. It just does. 
And, and I know Ellen and I, we have experienced that in very real terms. And, and, and I know it's true because it has worked that way in my life. Now, whether we have much or we have little, God calls upon us to be dependent upon him totally, totally. Today, if you would, turn with me to a very familiar passage in uh, Mark chapter 12, 41 to 44. We're going to look at this story about the, the poor widow who gave all that she had. Mark 12, verses 41 to 44, and I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Verse 41, And he sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how the people were putting money into the treasury. And many rich people were putting in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which amounts to about a cent. Calling his disciples to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surpluses. But she, out of her poverty, put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we open your word today, Lord, may it be impacted upon our hearts. May you open our hearts to its understanding today. And and Lord, as we look at this thing about giving, just giving back to you what you have already owned, Lord, may we understand it, it, it's not about supplying uh, money for the work of the church, though that's where it goes. But, Lord, it's about what we think about you. It's about our dependence upon you. It's about our trusting you today with all that we have, whether it be our finances, whether it be our time, our talents, and and all our resources. Lord, may we be found trusting you today with all that we have. Lord, move among us. May Jesus be glorified. For it's his name, in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, to put this story into perspective and context, it's, it's interesting. A lot of times as I, as I look at a story such as this, and you look at the, what has come before and comes after, we realize, at least according to Mark, this story occurs, this is the last thing Jesus does as part of his public ministry prior to going on, uh, going to the cross. If you look at chapter 13, I'll be mentioning that in a minute. It's, he's given an Olivet Discourse, and, and that's, that's instructing his disciples. And then we get into the Last Supper and, and the events there. And, and we look at the week that has come before, and it's been after the triumphal entry. But when we consider that this is the last thing that Jesus did, and, 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 and the story is about sacrifice... And we consider just a few days later, Jesus sacrificed his all for us. When we consider that, let's look at it from the terms of sacrifice. Look at verse 41. And it says that he, that is Jesus, sat down opposite the treasury and began observing how people were putting money into the treasury. It's interesting uh, where they were located in the temple was probably the court of the women. And in the court of the women, there were 13 big brass funnels called trumpets called trumpets. And and he was looking at the people come and put money in there. He was watching people place in the trumpets and because they were made of brass and back then they didn't have paper money. And they didn't write checks like we do today. Everything was in coins and and the rich would come in with their bag of coins whether it be gold or silver or whatever it was made of and the big coins and, and when you when you put a coin in the trumpet it was a kaching, you know, it you can hear it go in and and some 
sometimes they would empty the bag in there and ka-ching, ka-ching, ka-ching. It sounds like you're in Las Vegas, you know, and, 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 and doing the coin. But it catches everybody's attention. When you put uh, put put in uh, put in all these coins, big coins, and Jesus was noting not only who was giving the money to the temple, but how they were giving and how much they were giving. Now, we need to be very careful here. Jesus wasn't condemning large gifts. Okay, so uh, be very careful here. But 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 uh, but understand, he's not condemning any of that. But it's 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 you know the Bible's very big, and and Jesus is very big on how it's given, and how it's given. In Matthew chapter 6, and we're familiar with this story, uh, it's from his uh, uh, Sermon on the Mount, uh, chapter six, Matthew 6 verses 1 and 2, he, he says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them, otherwise you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. Verse 2, so when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet. Now, the trumpet here might be referred to those trumpets at the temple, sounding the trumpet, ching, ka ching, ka ching, you know. Uh, when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. And, and so we can, we can assume there were some there that wanted to impress folks and they would empty the bag in there and, 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 and they would look for all the noise those trumpets would make. And scripture tells us, Jesus tells us, they've got their reward. They have their reward in full. But now we come to verse 42. And it says, a poor widow came. When we think of widows back then, that doesn't mean all widows are poor, but you know, they didn't have life insurance. They didn't have things. They, uh, You know, widows only had families to take care of them, and some of them didn't have families. And, and, and this poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which amounts to a cent. Uh, actually, in the Greek, it's called leptas. Uh, that means little or small or thin. And and there are two small brass coins. I mean, look at the picture there. Uh, these are, uh, it's much smaller, half the size of our penny. Uh, in fact, the NIV says it, it, it was worth about a penny. It, 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 they weren't very much. Actually, if we were to get technical here, it was about one one hundredth of a denarii. A denarii uh, was the average um, daily wage for the average worker, okay? One one hundred. And and with that with these coins, she might be able might be able to buy a handful of refined flour or one very meager meal. Go on to verse 43 and 44, and this is Jesus, Jesus calling his disciples to him. He said to them, truly I say to you, this poor widow put more than all the contributors to the treasury. You know, in God's eyes, it's not the amount of money that's given, it's how the money is given. It's, 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 it's not so much as what we give, but, uh, we might even want to look at how much do we have left? How much do we have left? And it says, for they, speaking about all these others, for they put out of, put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, her offering was quite literally food out of her mouth. She gave up all she has. The Greek says, it's interesting, when I go back and look at the Greek, it says she put in her whole life. Her whole life. That's all she had. And can you imagine the little little uh, widow woman walking up to the trumpet and where we've been hearing ka-ching, ka-ching, and she puts in these two little coins and this kind of dingle, dingle. <laughs> no one ever heard. No one even noticed. But you know, God notices. God notices. Where the others gave from their access, you understand, they put it in, they did it. Some of them may have done it for show, but they're not going to miss it. They're not hurting a bit. But she gave all that she had to live on. 
Okay, you may say, Doug, you know, we, we get it. Uh, God doesn't count the amount. He counts the sacrifice. But let's put this in the sacrifice. Uh, and, and let's put this in terms of sacrifice in context here. The, the teaching with the widow's might is, as I have mentioned a minute ago, this is where Jesus ends his public ministry. And it's Wednesday of Passion Week. Two days later, Jesus literally gives it all. Where she gave her whole life, Jesus gave his whole life for us. Jesus is making a transition here because as he's teaching here, and as I mentioned in chapter 13, he's going on to the Olivet Discourse, and that's instructions to his disciples, talking about what's going to come on in the future. And understand the things that are coming in the future, there's going to be trials. And later on, the disciples uh, turned apostles, they will have only God to depend upon. And this poor widow put in all she had, and she has God and God alone to depend upon. This little widow woman, she gave her all. She had nothing left. Very similar to another story. Uh, I want to pick up for just a second where Jerry left off last Sunday. You know, remember about the brook drying up? What do you do when the brook dries up with with uh, with Elijah? When there's nothing left and you've got to have you, you it, 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 you've got to have dependence upon God. And so when the brook dried up uh, last week and, and and look it up, read it in in uh, King first King seventeen, uh, where did God send Elijah when the brook dried up? He sent him to another little old widow woman who had nothing but a son to support. She had nothing. In fact, he goes up to her and God says, she's going to support you. And and he asked, well, make me a cake. And she says, I only got a little flour and a little oil. And and the plan was, uh, uh, I was going to make a cake and for my son and I, and and then we're going to die because there's nothing left. And he says, make make me a cake and and for you and your son. And he says, you know, uh, your flower pot is not going to ever go empty and your jug of oil won't ever go dry as, as long as there's a drought. Remember, there was a drought in the land. Nobody was being able to farm or harvest or do anything. As long as there was a drought, these will stay full. And she trusted God. And she provided not only for herself and her son, she provided for Ezekiel as well. Same story here. God provided for her. Her total dependence was upon God. It wasn't anything that she did. She didn't go out and plant anything. She didn't harvest anything. She depended upon God. In the day story, we could have pointed out that Jesus should have said to her, and there's others saying, you know, she should have held back at least one of those coins. She, she should have maybe even kept them and provided for herself. But he didn't do that. He could have scolded her about her imprudence. But, you know, and, and especially considering the system of that day, and, and I'm not going to get into these verses that follow, but uh, that, that preceded this story. But uh, uh, Jesus was, uh, was talking about the, uh, uh, the scribes and all who would, who, who, who would ravish widows uh, for repentance. They, they would completely leave widows destitute, saying because you had to give it all. And and they live very lavishly. You know, certainly Jesus condemned all of that. But Jesus commend, uh, commended the godliness of this poor widow in comparison to the pretend godliness of those who pro, uh, pro, possessed much wealth. This poor widow trusted God with all she had. She trusted God for her very survival and her daily existence, illustrating very graphically her total dependence upon God. What did Jesus say for us? Back to the Sermon on the Mount in uh, Matthew 6, 33. Jesus says, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things, all your subsistence, all your daily food, all your housing, all your clothing, all these other things, when we go back and put it into context, all these other things will be added to you. And so the question is, 
Where is our focus? Is it on the things of God or on the things of this world? Over and over again, Jesus tells us to look to God, to trust in Him. And, and he, he was teaching His disciples to understand the things of God and the ways of God. You know, the things of God and the ways of God is vastly different from our ways and our things and our way of thinking. You know, uh, the ways of God is not natural ways for man. It is difficult, you know, and if you think about it, it is difficult compared to this widow who had only these two little coins. It's difficult for uh, those with much riches, with much wealth, to give it away. Now, I'm not here to suggest that that is what God is calling for us to do. But he does call for us to make sacrifice at times. And we go back a couple of chapters in, in Mark, Mark chapter 10. We look at the rich young ruler. You know, you know the story, the rich young ruler, what must I do to inherit uh, eternal life? And Jesus says, have you done this, that, and the other? And he says, yep, I've, I've done all of this stuff since my youth. And, 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 Mark 10, verse 21, we read, it says, Looking at him, Jesus felt a love for him and said to him, One thing that you lack, go and sell all that you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven, and come follow me. The guy's wealth was getting in the way of between him and God. And it says in verse 22, but at these words, he was saddened. That is the rich young ruler. And he went away grieving for he was one who owned much property. You know, Jesus goes on to say in the following verses, looking at verses 23 and 25. And it said, Jesus looking around said to his disciples, how hard is it will be for those who are wealthy to enter the kingdom of God? Verse 25, he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You, you, you see, that, that was quite radical thinking back in that day, because back in that day, it was assumed that if you had riches, you had wealth, God was blessing you. You know, look around our world today. There's a lot of people with a lot of wealth. They, they get it from unscrupulous sources. I can make examples, but I won't. Uh, and, and, and they're quite wealthy, and we, it is not necessarily the blessing of God. Uh, some of these folks, I think they're in league with the devil. I'm not, here again, I'm not going there. But, but it, 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 we, we look at it, in that day it was a sign of God's approval. And, and whether or not we want to admit it, many of us believe that's true today. Yes, God has blessed but when God has blessed us, there's a danger there because then we start putting our trust in the blessings, if you will. And the trust in the wealth and in the material things that he has allowed us to have instead of of him. And we shift our trust to riches, our trust to stock portfolios, to certificates of deposit. We trust our 401ks and we trust our retirement benefits. Do we trust that our economy will turn around? Do we trust our banks? Do we trust our government will remain solvent? Uh, our currency, in our currency we have, in God we trust. In God we trust. But do we in practice? Uh, I think in practice uh, we say, I, I, I trust the FDIC. You know what the FDIC is? That's the uh, Federal Deposit Insurance. Insurance Corporation. That's the one that says, if you got up to $100,000 in the bank, it is a guarantee you will never lose it. I, we trust them more than we trust God, I believe, oftentimes. Do, what do we trust? We have been entrusted, uh, and, and as we're talking about stewardship, we've been entrusted with a great number of things. How do we use what has been given to us? Now, as David has uh, so elegantly read to us earlier in Luke 16, verses 10 and 11, he says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. He who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, understand unrighteous wealth, we're talking wealth. Money itself is amoral. Uh, that word amoral, it means it's neither good or bad. 
It's how we use it. Understand, money is a tool. And he says, the, the faithful use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust when true, with, the, uh, with the true riches to you? My mother, years ago, and this is what got me tithing. It was, uh, I, I remember talking, and I think I've told this story before, but it's worth saying again. My, uh, I remember I was, uh, uh, I was getting out of the Army, and I was finishing up school to go into the Air Force, and I had a time when I had very little money. And I said, well, I just won't be able to put the $20 bill in the offering plate on Sunday. I might have to cut it down to you know, maybe a five or a one. And and my mom looked at me like I was crazy, you know. She says, how can you afford not to tithe? And she goes, you know, if you had $10, it's it's not so hard to give a buck. When you have $100, no, well, I can give 10 But what happens if you work real hard and you get $1,000? Are you ready to give 100 what if all of a sudden $10,000 were to come into your lap? How easy can we apart with $1,000? You know, the more money we have, the harder it is to give away. Harder it is to give away. You know, it's uh, if we're faithful with $10, will we still be as faithful if we had $100,000 to give to the Lord what belongs to Him? Where are our treasures is the treasures in our banking account or what we can earn is our treasures in our earthly possessions uh, you know or what do we do with them for the glory of God Jesus told the rich young ruler that he would have treasures in heaven you know so all that you have and give it to the poor Matthew six twenty one, as we read earlier he, uh, Jesus says for where your treasure is there your heart will be also so where's our heart Is our heart on our stuff or is our heart on true treasures in heaven? Now, let's go back and let's relook at that widow with the two little mites that she gave. It was not her offering. It was not the fact that she kept nothing back for herself. You see, it moves more than just sacrifice here. It was all about her trust in God. He trusted God for her very existence and her daily living. Do we have that kind of trust or do we hang on to our stuff? Um, Look at Job. I love the story of Job, especially the big picture there. You you, You know the story of Job. Job was a very rich man and God allowed Satan to take it all away. Take it all away. And what was Job's response to that? Job 1, verse 20 and 22. It says, Then Job arose and tore his robe and shaved his head, and he fell to the ground and worship. His response was worship? Hmm. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And through all this, Job did not sin, nor did he blame God. He attributes all to God, whether it's plus or minus. It's not about what I'm going to give or even how much I'm going to keep. It's about trusting God with all that we are and all that we have. Are we willing to give it all up if if God calls us to do so? Ellen and I, we've known missionaries on the field that in order to go to the field, they had to quite literally sell all that they had. They had to literally burn all their bridges in order so that they could go to the mission field. You know, a lot of it was the square away debts and everything else, but so that they could be completely unencumbered when they went to the mission field. They had to give it all in order to go where God has called them. Do we ever make a sacrifice for God? And we have to understand the nature of a sacrifice. It's not a sacrifice if the gift means nothing to us. It is not a sacrifice if we merely give out of what is excess to us. In other words, if we're not going to miss it. And it's not sacrifice if it's not yours to give. 
Uh, I, I find so many people, including our government, that are very free with my money. Uh, it, it's not a sacrifice if we sacrifice other people's money. The gifts we make, the sacrifices we make, must be done willingly. You know this verse, Second Corinthians 9, 7. It says, uh, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart. You know, understand, God puts the purpose in our heart. It is my purpose that I need to give to this, whether it's the tithe, first of all. And 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 Ellen and I, we practice this. Uh, we don't believe we give an offering till after we've given the tithe. And 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 if we give to certain things, uh, we give to compassion and uh, you know uh, the different charitable organizations as well as uh, special ministries of the church. But we don't give a offering till after we give uh, give the tithe. And it, it goes on to say here, uh, what is he a purpose in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion? For God loves a cheerful giver. You know when I write a check to the IRS, the IRS could care less whether I gave that cheerfully or grudgingly. They don't care. They just care if I write the check for the proper amount. And I do write the check. Uh, I'm, I'm very particular, and those who know me, I'm, I'm very on top of the money and everything. I write the check, and not for one penny more than I should. <laughs> But but you understand, the IRS doesn't care how I give it, but the Lord does. God cares how I give. Uh, you know, one, one thing that we read all the time from 1 Corinthians 13, what's that called? The love chapter? What does it say? One of the first, uh, uh, verse 3 in there. And it says, if I give all that I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love... I gain nothing. It's all about how we give. How we give. Uh, and, and, and understand, if we get, if all we have is a penny and we give it with the widow's heart, it's great gain to me and it's great gain to God. You know, it, it was just a little tink, tink in that big brass bucket. But look how God has multiplied that that poor widow, and that story has been given for 2,000 years now. How much money has that two little mites gained for the Lord over the last 2,000 years? You know, God can do great things with nothing. Think about that. It's not the amount. It's all about our heart. When we give to God, we need to understand we're only returning a portion of what is already His. It all belongs to Him. If we say we trust God with our lives and our eternal future, will we trust God and will we trust Jesus with our wallets? We sing, All to Jesus I Surrender. That was another good hymn. And in a few minutes, we're going to sing the hymn, I Give All to You. Do we really mean it? Do we really mean it? You know, there there are things that we use our money for, just daily activities and daily living. And we need to buy food, and we got to pay the mortgage, and 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 got to pay the insurance. And there are things that we got to do. But with our money, does it, does every bit of it go to glorify God? And that includes what's given to the church. And you know, sometimes. We use our money for things that we wouldn't go and brag to other people about. And we use our money unwisely. How do we use the resources that God has given us? When we sing, I give all to you, do we really mean it? Do we really trust Jesus with all that we have? Are we totally dependent on him? As we come to this time of invitation, I do want to give a, uh, to give an invitation. You know, maybe there might be someone here or someone online that has never truly trusted Jesus. And understand, when we trust Jesus, it's all it's with all that we are and all that we have. Do we trust Him 
completely. And if we trust him with our eternity and our eternal future with him, our wallet is such a small thing to consider. Such a small thing to consider. Do we trust him today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today. And, and Lord, we're, we're going to be singing about trusting all, uh, giving all to you. And Lord, may all that we have be dedicated to you and used for your glory. And Lord, and what we do in this vote that comes up to support our budget. And Lord, and what we give to, uh, to further your work here at Rosemont. Lord, we are trusting you today. And we're trusting you to move in our lives, to guide us, to direct us, and to show us how we can best do for you. Lord, move among us. Touch those that are here. Lord, there may be somebody that needs to make that decision uh, from uh, whether it's to trust you initially or to let go of that one thing that we've been holding back for ourselves. Lord, that we truly turn over everything to you. May Jesus be glorified in this place, for it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.